such as campaigns or trends, um, can enter into a consumer's decision to buy a product. I think we talked about Snapchat and all these other things that, that people think they're really cool for the moment. Justin Bieber, maybe a little younger than you guys, but he's cool for the moment. Will it be cool, you know, next year? I don't know. It's about popularity and campaigns and trends. As an executive assistant the other thing that can affect this demand is demographics. These are the characteristics of a population with respect to age, race, and gender. So if we live here in the Northeast, we don't eat a lot of grits in the Northeast. But if you go down south, demand for grits increases significantly based on demographics. The next thing is expected future prices. Consumers choose not only which products to buy, but also when to buy them. If I know that Black Friday sales are coming up, demand will increase because I, right now it will decrease because I'm waiting for Black, Black Friday. So I'm going to hold off on my shopping so demand right now goes down. And when the prices go down, Demand they goes up. The following information for Jason's landscaping business. He had revenue. Expected future prices. He paid wages to an employee. So these are his payroll taxes. What effect will the baby boomers have on the economy? So if all of these people are retiring, look at our percentage of people over the, over the age of 65. What kind of demand will they have? Will they demand more or less medical care? Probably more, right? Um, what about cars? Will they all be driving? Another hmm. mower? What about and the housing market? This truly affects the price of condos, one floor homes, and ranches. Had, had the um, it might actually mean that you can buy a bigger the home, multi-level home, for less tax, money because there's tax, so many people demanding condos and one floor homes that the baby boomers are buying that up. Changing the housing market, right? Each on their due dates. So let's and talk about variables that shift the demand curve. If there is an increase in income, and a this will SB. shift the Let's demand curve right. Consumers will spend Remember more of their can. higher incomes on the good. In order. If there is an increase in income and the good is an inferior items. good, so we're gonna consumers will spend less on this. Out. So we're demand will shift payment. less or decrease because so they'll spend more of their number. income on higher goods or normal goods. Then we have if there's an increase in the price of a substitute. Hurting. So, if there if hamburgers bought, so if hamburgers and pizza and they live at one, two, are three, substitutes three. and the price of hamburgers goes to $10 a hamburger. Right well, Alabama. that means you're just going to demand more pizza because of what happened to the substitute good of hamburgers. Okay, so they are filing married filing. Here. Now, let's talk about chips and salsa. Now, if I only like to buy chips and salsa, but corn is being used um, for gas, so that increases the price of chips, I'm going to say, well, I don't know. If I have to pay $6 for a bag of, of chips, I'm not going to buy chips. And in return, I'm also not going to buy... And he is, salsa. So that means that it is a complementary good, and salsa would shift to the left, decrease. Now, if there's an increase in the taste for the good, it's trendy, everyone has it, I need it, I want it, then demand, it just means we're willing to buy more of these at the same price. Children, so or at every price. Now, if there's right, a change in population, so if we increase the population, so in general, the demand problem, is going to shift to the right because there's more people to buy. She had wages of forty-five thousand. If we if we believe there is an increase in the expected future prices, so we think that gas prices are going to go up by a dollar next week. What's going to happen to the yeah, demand for gas interest. today? Well, the demand for gas today is going to increase immediately. So everyone will be at the gas pump. And so there'll be an increase in demand immediately to avoid the future higher price. Two twenty-five. We'll do some more work and clap on these. We do not have to fill out a Schedule B because it's under fifteen hundred dollars. We need then to understand the difference between a change in demand and a change in quantity demanded. Okay. You can access the so, in the book, so you could follow. If we along move, me. if we change price now. We'll have to fill out a or a tablet from seven hundred dollars. Now they have point A to $600, which is point B. This is movement along the same curve. Now, this is this just a price change in the same marketplace. Is a bit a this is just a change in quantity demanded. It is not a change in overall demand. Now, 
if consumers' well, income increases, increase so we'll we have more purchasing power, that's not going to move from A to B. That's going to actually move from A to C, which means at $700, we used to demand 3 million tablets a month, but now at $700 because the consumer's income has increased. We're going to demand 500. That's an increase of 2 million tablets per month. Because, and that's a shift in demand, not demand want to be demanded. And I'm going to go look up. One of the things that entrepreneurs do is them. decide which products to develop products um, and which, what the demand for these forecasted products consumer. On the so supply side, you Google, always have to pretend to yourself um, said, you're a business C, owner. You own the business. The you're going to supply it to the marketplace. Your goal is profit. IRS. We're going to discuss the variables and that I influence down supply. To line B. So and quantity supply. Code, this here. is the amount of good so or service here, that a firm is willing and able to supply at a given price. And we are looking for. I land. may not be able to supply any more at a given price. So it just may be, be a reality. Here. So I must be willing and I must be able. A supply schedule is a table that shows the relationship between the price uh, of the product and the quantity of the product to be supplied. Uh, is not a supply curve shows the relationship between the mining, price of a product and the quantity of the product that will be supplied. Personal and laundry services. So let's check this out. Now we're back into the tablet market. We're talking about tablets. Remember, the demand curve was facing downward sloping. As price increased, as price decreased in demand, quantity increased. Supply works the opposite. As the price changes for Apple, Toshiba, Samsung, LG, and other tablet firms, as they're able to charge a higher price, they're willing to supply more. Why? Well, you have to have a factory. You have to be able to produce it. You might have to hire more people. So therefore, at $300 a tablet, they would only supply 3 million tablets a month. At $700 a tablet, they're willing to supply 7 million iPads a month, iPad tablet ideas. So, the law of supply states that the rule that holding everything else constant, which is Ceridus Paribus, increase in price causes an increase in quantity supplied, and a decrease in price causes a decrease in quantity supplied. Now, just like supply, we can have change in supply that could be producing with my time. And resources. Number of firms in the marketplace. A change in the number of firms will change the supply. And then finally, expected future prices. If a firm expects that a, that the price of a product will be higher in the future than it is today, there's an incentive to decrease the supply now and wait and increase it in the future when they can charge a higher price. Let's talk about variables that shift the curve. So. Number one, if there's an increase in the price of an input, this would decrease supply. That means it's going to cost us more to produce it, which means we can't supply as much at that same price. He's going to be on a cash basis. If there is an increase in productivity, and we're getting more efficient, that means that the cost of producing the good could fall, which means we could shift supply to the right or increase supply. If the price of a substitution in production increases, then we will shift or decrease demand for that product, and we would produce more of the substitution. If there's an increase in the number of the firm, remember you, you always hear that competition is good. Well, that's because every time a new firm enters the marketplace, it's going to change the supply in that marketplace or increase the supply. That drives down the price of the product. And if there is a an increase in the now, expected future price of a product. Business, you will decrease really supply today. Hold out as a supplier or business so owner. Remember, think like a business owner. You would decrease the supply and wait until you could charge more. Line five and line seven are all going to be. We need to know the difference between a change in supply versus a change in quantity supply. If the price of That's tablets rise. From five hundred dollars okay. to six hundred dollars so a tablet. Other this will result in movement up the supply curve from point A, five hundred dollars, to point B. This is not a change in supply. This is a change in quantity supplied. We just changed it from five million to six million. Payroll, taxes, but that's because we changed the price. Now, if 
there's an it, a, if the price of an input decreases or there's a technology change we shift the curve to the right and we go from point b which is six hundred dollars a tablet we sell six million to point c at the new six hundred dollars a tablet we sell eight million so that's a change in supply we will go over this again in class. You'll do some homework examples. But you need to know the difference between change in supply and change in quantity supply. We will talk about market equilibrium in the next live class. He also purchased all of these items. So we are going to go fill out his return, his depreciation. So I am going back to the depreciation problem. I filled out the worksheet um, that I provided you in class. But I, basically, they have the truck, over 6,000 pounds, a mower, a second mower, and then equipment. So they were all 100% business use, and these were the purchase prices. Um, and then we're going to select 179. So I put $25,000 here. I'm going to show you how I got that 25,000. I went to pub 946, how to depreciate. And then I went to look up section 179, how much can I deduct? So I clicked on the link. And this talks about property for lodging, dollar limits. Then we go up in here. Your section 179 is generally the cost of the quality firing property. However, you can elect to deduct this under 179 subject to the dollar limits. So we are not looking for dollar limits. Also, there is something for passenger automobile limit. So let's click and see if that applies. And this is not a passenger automobile. It's a truck. So we're going to scroll down and go to the 2012 trucks and vans. The maximum depreciation deductions for trucks and vans placed in service after 2002 are higher than those than other automobiles. The maximum deduction for the truck is shown below. Date placed in service, we're going 2012 and this is the first year. But actually, this is a vehicle over 6,000 pounds. So I'm going to go to my appendix here. I'm actually going to look up the word truck. So I'm going to go down here and click truck. So actually, I'm here at passenger automobiles. A passenger automobile is a four-wheel vehicle made primarily for the use on public streets, roads, and highways, rated at 6,000 pounds or less. This is over 6,000 pounds. Um, the following vehicles are not considered passenger automobiles. An ambulance, hearse, or combination ambulance hearse. Um, a vehicle used directly in the trade of transport, so a limousine or a truck or van that is qualified non-personal use vehicle. So since this is qualified a non-personal use vehicle, we can actually deduct the whole amount of this truck. So I'm going to go back here and put 28,000. Now, we're also going to section 179, the, all, the mower, the second mower, and the third. So our total section 179 that we want to take is $44,995. So I'm going to take this number and I'm going to go to my 4562. So on my 4562, I'm going to fill out Jason's name. Jason Herding. And this is his landscape business. Land, landscaping. This is his social security number. Okay. So if you look up in the instructions, the maximum amount would be five hundred thousand dollars. 
line two, how much section 179 do, did it cost? 44995 So the threshold, if you look this up in the instructions, is $2 million. And line four says the reduction. So there is no reduction. Line five, the dollar limitation for this year. Subtract line four from line one. 500,000. So we're going to write C attached. So we would put the depreciation sheet here. And the cost of the property was 44995 And we're taking the entire amount at section 179. So we put that on B and C. Line 8 says enter the total of section 179. 995. 10. Enter the smaller of 5 or 8. 44995. Carryover deduction. There is no carryover. So now enter the business limitation amount. Enter the smaller of the business income or line 5. So 153. So the section 179 expense allowed. So since it is not more than that, we can allow the entire section 179. So add lines 9 and 10, but do not enter more than 11. We did not. I will have to. Okay, so we had a little Adobe problem, but I'm back here. So, last thing we did was put the section 179 on line 12. We are then going to carry that down to line 22, our total, 44995. And we are going to take that total, and we are going to put it on the Schedule C. Depreciation, 44995. Now we're going to add up all the expenses. $90,202. Total expenses, $90,202. So now we need to subtract that from our income. Sixty two seven nine eight. So that is our tentative profit. Seven nine eight. And we didn't have any business use of the home. Seven nine eight. So now we're going to save this schedule C and I'm going to take this sixty two seven nine eight and I'm going to enter it in the ten forty line twelve. I first do that, 1040 line 12, 62798. And I'm also going to enter it on the schedule FE line 2. So schedule FE, we're going to go to the self-employment tax. So Jason Curtin, 4, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 0. Right. And on line two, I'm going to skip right down there, and it's going to be 62798. Combine, line three says combine 1A, one one 1B, one and 2. So 62798. 
Then it's going then we're going to multiply that by ninety two point three five. Which equals five seven nine nine four. So if line four is one hundred and ten thousand dollars or less, multiply by thirteen point three. Okay. Seven seven one three. So that's what's going to go on line five. Seven seven one three. Now, if the amount on line five is fourteen thousand or less, multiply by point five seven five one four four three, and we're going to round to six. So four four three six. Enter this result on. 1040 line 27. So I'm going to save this actually. Save as. Save this in the folder. Chapter 6. Chapter 2. Three, schedule. Okay. okay. So this goes on line 54. So let me pull up my 1040. Line 54. I'm going to scroll all the way down. And this is going to be six five. Sorry. Seven seven one three. Now twenty seven is where we put one half of that. Self employment tax deductible. That is four four three six. Four four three six. Okay. So I'm going to save this just in case we have another Adobe problem. I'm done with the SE and I am done with the schedule B. So let's go back to finishing this problem. We don't have any other income, so we're gonna total lines one through twenty one. And if we add this up, it equals 109,845. Okay. The only thing we have for AGI, adjust, adjustments for gross income, is the self-employment tax, which is 4,436. So if we subtract that, we get 105,409. Oops, typo here. 105,409. That is our AGI. So. 105409. Now it says that they itemize, so I'm going to hit save and I'm going to pull up a schedule A. So this is Jason and Vicky Harding. And we will type in Jason's number. They didn't have any medical expenses, so we'll put a zero on line four. Okay, they did have state and local income tax. And this was from withholdings from Vicky. Zero. They had real estate tax. And that was equal to 2100 And they had other taxes, $425. So if we add those up, 4815 They had home mortgage interest, so they would put that on line 10. 8,300. And that's the only interest they had, so carry that number through here. And they did make charitable contributions. No gifts were over $2,500. I mean, sorry, over 250 It was just contributions adding up to that. So line 19 should be 2,400. They didn't have any casualty theft or loss or other expenses or other miscellaneous. So we are going to have a total of 15,000. 15,515. We're going to take this amount and put it on line 40. So I'm going to save this. Save as. Chapter 6. And 
we're going to move this number over to the 1040. So, 1545. Now, if we subtract that from the 105, we're going to get 89, 894. And if we multiply 4 by 3,800, we will get 15,200. And if we subtract that from the 8,900, we'll get 74, 694. And that's the number we're going to look up in the tax table. I'm going to go here, I'm going to go to 2012 tax table. And it's 74, 694, and they are married filing joint. I'm going to scroll through here and get to 74,000. Okay, 74, 694. Alright, so married filing joint. It's going to be 10,729. 10,729. That is the tax. 10,729. They don't qualify for AMT. They are going to get a child tax credit, $1,000 per child. I know we haven't covered this yet, but they do qualify. So, line 54 will be $2,000, and line 55 will be $8,729. So, if we add that up, we have 8729 plus 7.13, 16,442 is their tax. She had 6870 with help from her check, and they said they paid quarterly payments of $3,000 for a total of $12,000. So if we go all the way down the line, 18870. So let's see. We paid more than we owe, so we're going to get a refund. 18870 minus 16442. $2,428. All right. And that is a self-employment tax return. Actually, it's very pretty comprehensive. Actually, I almost forgot they had qualified dividends, so I'm going to have to go back up to this tax number of 774694, seven, and I'm going to have to subtract 125. So. Seven, four, six, nine, four, minus $125 in qualified dividends. So we're going to look up 74569 in the tax table. 74569. 10704. So I'm going to make a little note in my here. So click here. Tax on 10704 and then they make more than the 7 70,700 marriage filing joint which means their dividends will be taxed at a special rate of 15%. So 125 times 0.15 $19. 19 or 15% of dividends. Total tax is 10704 plus 19 equals 1723. So we saved a few bucks here. So I'm going to put that number in 723. So we're going to make 123. 
basically. So let's re add this. Eight, seven, three plus seven, seven, one, three. Sixteen, four, thirty six. Four, thirty six. So that gives us a refund of four thousand, two thousand. I have to recalculate this. So one eight eight zero minus one four thirty six two thousand four thirty four. So that's our refund. Every dollar counts, right? And that is a very comprehensive problem. This is the second half of chapter six, self-employment. We're going to talk about transportation and travel. Ordinary and necessary travel expenses are deductible. When they're referring to transportation, they are referring to expenses of getting from one workplace to another workplace within the taxpayer's home area. When they refer to travel, it means refer to travel away from the home that requires an overnight stay. For transportation to be deductible, it must be getting from one workplace to another. So if I have a second job, my transportation, now we're talking about self-employment. So if I'm getting from one workplace to another, so if I'm at a location in Chicopee and I need to go to Holyoke, then the transportation between Chicopee and Holyoke would be deductible. Also, visiting clients and customers, and a business meeting away from the taxpayer's regular workplace. Also, getting from your home to a temporary workplace. So, if I've been temporarily assigned to Boston, but I normally meet in Springfield, my transportation to Boston would be deductible. Transportation between home office and a temporary work location is deductible. Now, when we're talking about automobile expenses, the standard mileage rate for 2012 is 55 cents. Actual expenses are the actual business auto costs that are deducted. So in the very first year, you will choose actual or standard. If you don't choose standard, then you can't ever use standard mileage in the first year. If you choose actual, it would be depreciation, gas, repairs, oil changes, that. If you choose standard, you don't calculate all that. You track your mileage. Actual expenses usually gives a larger deduction but requires more record keeping. Travel costs for business. This requires an overnight stay. So if I have to go to West Virginia and stay for three nights, that would, for business, that would be travel. So travel, meals, and lodging, and other incidentals expenses are allowed. It should last no more than one year. You can't call it travel if it lasts more than one year. Limitations exist if the trip is partially for business or if there is, or partially for personal, or if there is lavish or extravagant expenditures. I'm going to a tax conference in San Diego. I'm going to be there for a week. And then I'm going to stay three extra days and sightsee. My stay for those three extra days and sightseeing is not deductible. Meals and entertainment. Business meals costs are deductible, but limited to 50%. So if I spent $2,000 on meals for my business this year, only 50% would be deductible in the tax return must be directly related or associated with business. So if I'm meeting a client and we are reviewing their tax return and they're signing it and we're having coffee, deductible. If I'm meeting a friend and we're having food but we are not talking about business, not deductible. Standard meal per diem is $46 per day but can be higher in higher cost areas. You would look this up in the publication. Also, the meals and entertainment cannot be lavish or extravagant. I cannot have a thousand dollar dinner um, when I when I would only make you know fifty dollars off selling selling the person something. Can a taxpayer take depreciation on a business auto and use the standard mileage rate at the same time? That's false. Transportation costs are allowed when the taxpayer visits a client. Only when the taxpayer visits the client. Shouldn't be only. A deduction is allowed for meals, lodging, and other incidentals when a taxpayer travels away from home requiring sleep. That is correct. So, a taxpayer can deduct $46 per day in meals and incidentals and $77 a day for lodging without keeping receipts on a business trip. This is subject to 50% limitation. 
taking five clients to a Major League Baseball game immediately following a substantial business discussion is deductible up to 50% of the cost in the open entertainment. So business use of the home. If I'm going to work out of my home, then I could use business use of my home. And business use of your home is deductible if the business is exclusive, regular, and for the taxpayer's charter business. A specific area of the home must be used only for business. Employees must be for the convenience of the employer. So if I have an employee at working at my home, it must be for the convenience of me. So, and this refers to if you're going to use business use of the home, if you're a W-2 employee, um, if your employer has you work from home because they have no office space, and it's for their convenience, they don't want to buy it or rent an office space, then business use of the home is deductible. Home office deductions are reported on an 8829. Calculation determined by square footage used regularly and exclusively for business. So if I have a thousand foot, my home is a thousand square feet and the room I use for my office exclusively is 250 square feet, that would be 25% business use of home. Direct expenses. So anything that is directly related to the business. So I buy a copier, scanner, all in one, and I use it only for business. That's 100% deductible. I buy a table for my desk. I buy a desk. Um, but my utility is not 100% deductible. Indirect home expenses are deductible on a square footage basis. So if utilities were $500 this year and my business use of home was 10%, that would be $50. Home office deduction is limited to business income. In order to have a home office deduction, you are limited. So if I only made $1,000 in my business, I'm limited to that. Order of deduction. So first you make the income or revenue, then you reduce the revenue by expenses, and then you would take business use of insurance, utilities, and then depreciation. Bad debt can be deducted as ordinary business expenses if they incurred in a business. Bad debt can be partially worthless or completely worthless. Business casualty losses. Receive an ordinary loss, limit, no limit, not limited by the 10% floor, like personal casualty losses are. So if it's a business casualty loss, there's a break-in at my business, um, then I'm not subject to the 10% AGI. When a business property is partially destroyed by a casualty, the loss is calculated by which of the following. Decreasing the fair market value of the property, the adjusted basis, the lower of the decrease in fair market value, or the adjusted basis, or the adjusted basis of the property less 10%. It's the lower of the decrease in fair market value or the adjusted property basis. Now, sometimes people confuse self-employment with hobby. So, Hobby losses. The expense is allowed to the extent of hobby income. Nine factors determine whether an activity is a hobby, and the burden of proof lies with the taxpayer. Order of expense deduction. Mortgage, interest, and taxes. Hobby expenses that do not reduce basis, then depreciation. Education expense is deductible if it's, ma if it's for maintaining or improving the skills of the taxpayer. It meets the express requirements of the law or regulation for a job. Education expenses are not deductible if they cannot meet the minimum educational requirements for the employment or it qualifies the taxpayer for a new trade or business. All of my money spent studying for the CPA exam, the materials and all of that, it was going to qualify me for a new trade or business, therefore not deductible. So, self-employment tax. This consists of two parts. In 2012, they had reduced the Social Security in tax to 10.4. Medicare was 2.9, so a total of 13.3%. Social Security limited to the first $110,100. So, if I earn $200,000, I stop paying Social Security after $110,100. Medicare is not limited, though.
So that's the end of this part, and we are going to do an example of a tax return.